Zealand and welcome to another episode of Turn the Page. My name is Mark Pacey from the Whited Up Archive. Today we are going through actually three chapters of Don Farmer's Walking Back to Happiness book because there's some nice short ones in there, unlike last week. I promise I won't be here for an hour this time. Starting off, chapter 14, One Final Fling. In the afterglow of finishing his primary schooling on a high, the boy was handed a prize of a different kind, one he could not refuse. Sister Elaine, now a vivacious teenager and her boyfriend Kelvin Brown, known to all as Brownie, had planned a summer holiday up north, but had run into a snag. Mum and Dad had their misgivings. Elaine was still very young to go tramping off with her boyfriend, even though they had trust in her. The solution? Take the two boys with you. They would jump at the chance, and wouldn't even suspect they were actually being hired as unofficial chaperones or the male equivalent. So, deal done. The boy became absent without leave from the picking plot and joined Elaine and Brownie and young Evan packing for the trip to Rotorua and Tauranga. There wasn't a lot of room for what they needed to take. Brownie's car was a little green two-door Morris Minor and it was tasked with carrying the four of them, a tent and tent poles, camp stretchers, bedding, sleeping bags, two lilos and suitcases full of clothes. The tent, tent poles and camp stretches were easy enough to sort out. They were secured to a roof rack. Suitcases were squeezed into a tiny boot and the rest of the gear shared the back seat with the two boys or was strewn on the floor. They left home early in the morning and needed as much time as possible to make the long journey to Rotorua, allowing enough time for a couple of pit stops along the way for lunch by Lake Taupo. Let's go. Laden to the gunnels, the little Morris valiantly chugged its way north, helped by the expert driving of its owner, who as a professional driver, albeit of trucks laden with timber and building supplies, could easily cope with a couple of excited rowdy kids in the back seat. For two boys, who had only ever before holidayed close to home at Lake Ferry, it was like a journey around the world. Sure, the boy had been to Christchurch by ship with his classmates, but this was altogether a different experience. The best part of two weeks on the loose with his one-time tomboy sister who has still had a healthy streak of rebellion in her veins and his rapscallion younger brother. The towns of the lower North Island flitted by. At Taihapi, Brownie pulled over for the obligatory toilet stop. All four were out of the car, emptying their bladders and stretching their legs and Brownie shouted ice creams all round. Back on the road, they headed for Waiuru, where many a young soldier had shivered his way through weeks of training. The majestic Mount Ruapehu loomed, its snow caps piercing and the cloudless blue sky soon followed by the two neighbouring volcanoes of Ngaruhoi and Tongariro. With the desert road behind them, the intrepid travellers arrived at Turangi, stopping for petrol before weaving their way round to Lake Taupo. Elaine had tucked a thermos flask of tea into her carry bag, along with a bottle of wacko pine nectar for Evan, who didn't quite qualify, or even want to, for a cup of choicer. At the lakeside, the four ate sandwiches wrapped in greaseproof paper and packed by the boy's mum, along with a stash of homemade biscuits and cake. From here on, they would be feasting on bought food. By mid-afternoon the stretch of story no that's not the stretch. By mid-afternoon the stench of sulphur hit the boys' nostrils, signalling they were approaching Rotorua. It was an unfamiliar smell. The boy wondered if he could ever survive it. So different it was from the pristine air of Greytown. He didn't know it yet, but his nose would soon acclimatize, and he would hardly notice it. Brownie pulled the little Morris into Rainbow Springs, their home for the next few days and out tumbled two excited boys. About to run off, they were hauled back by their sister. Oh, no, you don't. You can help unload the car and put the tent up. As soon as that was done, the boys went exploring. Scores of rainbow trout darting back and forth in the controlled waterways within their camp kept them amused until sunset, when it was back to the tent, a feed and a sleep. For the next few days, it was all on. At Whakarewarewa they watched the open mouth wonder, whoops, in, 
it should be in, not with. At Whakarewarewa, they watched in open-mouthed wonder at the Pohutu geyser exploded, shooting boiling water high into the air amidst a huge cloud of steam. They watched, but made sure they kept clear of the mud pools that bubbled up like porridge and threw pennies from a bridge to boys swimming in the stream below. The young swimmers dived for them, all the time urging to throw us some silver ones. Yeah, right. The boys had divvied up their spending money, allowing a set amount for each day. In theory, they would work. Mm, we did so well, we got through three pages without doing this. The boys had divvied up their spending money, allowing a set amount for each day. In theory, that would work, but in practice. The boys swam in the blue baths, took in some top concerts at the Sound Shell, including a performance by the emerging stars of New Zealand music, the Howard Morrison Quartet, and had their first taste of hangi food. In town they dangled their feet in the soda baths, did the shops over, and generally mucked about. There was never a dull moment. Early one morning, the boys left the tent to head to the dairy, a fair walk from their campsite. Evan had overspent his daily allowance the day before, so he was financially at the mercy of the boy for the next 24 hours. As they ambled along the footpath, the boys crossed over a culvert, and out of the corner of his eye, Evan caught sight of a trout in the water below. Soon they could see several trout, well outside the confounds of the Rainbow Springs, making their way through the water. A natural instinct was to try and catch them. We should try to tickle them, the boy suggested. Both boys had heard stories, probably heavily embellished, of huge trout being successfully tickled and tossed into the banks of the stream by a canny old fisherman. Well, they weren't old, and when it came to tickling trout, they soon proved to be anything but canny. Each time a trout appeared, the boys made valiant attempts to tickle it, giving up only when their fingers had turned blue, having not got within a bull's roar of a trout's underbelly. Setting off again, Evan declared that when they reached the dairy, he wanted a hot pie. For some unknown reason, the boy dug his toes in. You will have an ice cream, he said. I want a pie, said Evan. It's an ice cream or nothing, was his big brother's stubborn response. The exchange only ended when the boys heard music. Loud music, coming from a property close by. On the front lawn were two or three young men playing guitars through amplifiers and singing. They were joined by a slightly older woman who began singing, and by another young man who had set up his drum kit. The boy and Evan stopped to lean on the front fence and listen. Just who were these people? For all money, it could have been the Howard Morrison Quartet practicing. The ice cream versus pie debate began again as the boys moved off. Finally, they reached the dairy. The boy asked for two coned ice creams. I don't want an ice cream, Evan insisted. I want a pie. Only one ice cream then, and no pie, was the boy's final order. On the footpath, Evan, to put it mildly, descended into a black silence. Looking like a thundercloud, he stomped along the footpath, heading back to the camping ground, as the boy made exaggerated noises of pleasure, licking his vanilla cone. Brothers. From Rotorua, the holiday makers set or set sail. Let's do that again. From Rotorua, the holiday makers set sail for Tauranga. There they pitched the tent at Bucket's Motor Camp, an ideal spot on the water. Immediately behind the camp, a Mardi Gras was in full swing. The Ferris wheel whirled, the shooting galleries offered cheap, mass produced trinkets for those who knocked over the targets of metal strips and the crazy house spat out pre-recorded screams to tempt thrill-seekers. The two boys were in heaven, or to their minds in a combination of Palm Beach and Disneyland. As the hot summer sun beat down on them, they pumped up two lilos they had squeezed into the boot of the car before leaving home and headed for the water. That day passed without incident, but the next morning the sun was on full beam. It was a scorcher. The boy was soon back on the water and even followed. After an hour or so, the boy could feel his skin tingling, despite having been rubbed over with a weak brand of suntan lotion. Better call it a day, he said to himself. I could be starting to burn. Wading out of the water, he signalled to Evan to do the same. 
Evan would have none of it. Once again he demonstrated his stubborn streak. I'm all right, I'm staying out here. And stay he did, and still longer, until a further hour had passed and he emerged from the water, looking a bit anxious. His back had taken on the colour of a boiled lobster. It was soon obviously, whoops, let's say it again. It was soon obvious blistered agony was on the way, unless something was done to take the heat out of the situation. Elaine ferreted around in her suitcase, coming up with a bottle of Qtol and smothered Evans back in it. It soothed, but couldn't completely cure. That afternoon, that night and all the next day and night, young Evan lay face down on his camp stretcher bed, wearing only a pair of shorty pyjamas, sullen and sorry for himself, but stoic and largely uncomplaining. The boy did the brotherly thing looking after his stricken sibling, bringing him ice cream and feeding him whatever else was on hand in between visits to the Mardi Gras. Two days later, the worst was over. You boys can look after yourselves for a while. Brownie and I are going for a drive, said Elaine. The boy took a look at his brother, who was much brighter and looking to get back into the action, but still could not bear wearing anything heavy on heavy on his slowly recovering back. Let's go to the pictures, the boy suggested. And go they did. They walked into town, the boy in shorts and a shirt, his brother in his shorty pyjamas, both with bare feet. At the picture theatre, Evan shrugged off the quizzical looks that he received. The film over, they walked back to camp. Elaine was aghast. You didn't go to town in your pyjamas? The time eventually came to head back home to Greytown. All in all, it had been a great break, and the fun was not quite over yet. A pit stop or two later, the returning holiday makers reached Bulls. Elaine and Brownie decided to scout around the town shops, something that did not appeal to the two younger boys. Instead, they would go on their own way and seek out something to eat. As luck would have it, the milk bar tea rooms were not that far away, and in the two went. The young waitress approached and smiled at them and handed over a menu. The boys hadn't really thought about a sit-down lunch. Their holiday cash had all but run out. But they sat down, took a look at what was on offer, and counted the remaining coins. Pooling their funds, they could scrape up just enough for beans on toast. And that's when things went awry. Evan ran his eye over the menu. Look, they have extras. There's eggs, sausages, and onions. That sealed it. Both would have all the extras as well. Tucking in, the two were well into the meal when the young waitress returned with the bill. The boy looked at it in shock. Neither of them had realised the extras were not free. They had nowhere near enough to cover the cost of the meals. What do we do now? Evan asked, with even more than a hint of panic in his voice. Keep eating slowly while I think of something, the boy answered. No easy solution seemed to be on the horizon other than flight. Do exactly as I say, the boy instructed. When I say go, walk quickly to the door and then run like hell for the car. And that's what they did. At the car they sat down behind the vehicle on the tar seal and waited for Elaine and Brownie to return and unlock it. Thankfully, they didn't have long to wait. Do you want some lunch? Elaine asked. Both shook their heads somewhat violently. No, let's just go home, the boy said, as he and Evan slid suspiciously into the back seat, as they drove back past the tea rooms, fully expecting to see a staff of police standing out on the footpath. They arrived home to be greeted by Mum and Dad, looking refreshed. No doubt, having two wrapped scallions off their hands for a few days had been a holiday for them, too. The trip north set the seal on true boyhood for boy. Whoops, for the boy. The trip north had set the seal on true boyhood for the boy. Ahead of him was a whole new ball game. Soon he would be starting his secondary school education as a foundation pupil of Kurunui College. It had been a great way to sign off. How are we? 14 minutes. Hmm, trying to think if I can read two more chapters in the time we have left. Maybe not. That's right, we'll take our time and read uh, the small one after this. So, of course, I have a piece of music I have to play now. So this one, it's uh, 
some people have have songs and they're very very popular and then around christmas time they they change the lyrics and release the christmas version of a of a, of a song this is exactly that so i have a friend who sometimes goes by the name of Anders, who loves this particular song. And then when they found out there was a Christmas version, got very excited and thoroughly enjoyed it. So, of course, you can't play this one at any other time other than Christmas. So now that it is around Christmas time, I have to play this song for my friend Anders. Okay, we're having some issues with the microphone again. Why is it doing that? I think we have everything plugged in that we're supposed to have plugged in. Hmm, should we try that again? Let's try that again. No, it doesn't seem to be working. It's always technical difficulties when I'm here on my own. Because whatever I hear out of my headphones is what you're hearing. At least I hope that's the case. Hmm. I might have to restart the computer so you can... Ah, okay. So I'm just restarting the computer and hopefully that fixes it. <laughs> Shouldn't take too long. Uh, in the meantime, um, I'm not going to be obviously in the following Monday. I think that's New Year's Day. So I won't be here for that. But the following one, which is, I believe is the 8th, if I got my maths correct, I will be in then. So we won't see you for about a week or so and then we'll see you then. Don't have the longest break over Christmas, but that's fine. I'll take a break later on. I hope this works because this is a brilliant song. Worst case scenario, we'll play it next year. Just thinking about it. I heard that, so I'm sure you did, well, no, if the microphone was on, you would hear it. So I can hear things through my headphones again, so this, this is positive. so you don't hear the ad I think we've I think we've fixed it I think we've fixed it so we'll try this again so yes like I said this is a, a regular version of a, of a song that my mate Anders really loves this is the Christmas version of that song and I know they're a huge fan here we go
Okay, no, that is not working. We're just going to uh, have words for the rest of the uh, episode, which is fine. We'll do the uh, we'll do the music another time. So I'll give you two more chapters now that we don't have the song. Chapter fifteen: A Town Shared. The boy had belonged to Greytown, but Greytown had not belonged exclusively to the boy. Many others had come before him or lived to share the cosy corner of the wider upper valley with him, their names gradually fading into the annals of the town's history as the years marched past. True eccentrics like Midnight Mary and old Mrs. Rusty Bones had come and gone by the time the boy was born, but their names cropped up in Greytown pubs and chats over garden fences for decades after their demise. Midnight Mary, as her moniker suggests, was an elusive woman, whose life's journey was travelled mostly after dark. But not always. From time to time she would be seen in Main Street in daylight, one hand clasping a shopping basket, the other her constant companion, her umbrella. No one seemed to know from whence she came, and Mary didn't offer up the answer. She didn't like being asked anything as she hurried about, getting what she had come in town for and making off again. Mary's umbrella was what really set her apart from the others. She was never seen without it, regardless of the weather. It remained unfurled, shading her from both the rain and the sunshine, only folded down when Mary entered a shop. She made no small talk, pushed away attempts by anyone to break through her shield of unsociability, and successfully eluded anyone who might try to piece together any aspect of her life. Her real identity was blurred even in, during her lifetime, and disappeared entirely when Mary disappeared from the world stage. Young boys who would normally gang up to tag along after an old bod like Mary, perhaps to call out or throw cheek, never did. Her presence seemed to numb even the most courageous of them, and one day, whoops, and then one day she came no more. Mary's story remains only half told. In death, as in life, she was a mystery. Old Mrs. Rusty Bones had a proper name, but it was so foreign-sounding that few people could pronounce it, so she became Rusty Bones, which sounded similar to her real surname. Like Mary, Mrs. Rusty Bones was a mystery woman. It was never fully determined if she lived somewhere in Greytown or in an outlying area, as she was constantly moving about on foot. She would wander the streets, pushing a wicker pram laden with trinkets, cutlery, kitchen utensils, second-hand pots and pans, which she hawked door to door. Hawkers were usually men who scratched out a living selling bits and pieces or sharpening knives and scissors, so Mrs. Rusty Bones stood out as an exception to the rule. She wore a bonnet and a near ankle-length skirt that trailed over the top of tough leather shoes. The shoes had to be strong to be able to survive, scrunching along gravel roads for miles and miles as the old woman did her rounds. Unlike with Mary, the children of Greytown took great delight in following along behind Mrs. Rusty Bones, kidding her along and giggling to each other. She never seemed to mind, and would grin and mutter to herself. Maybe she liked to have company in what was an otherwise solitary life. As with Mary, what finally became of old Mrs. Rusty Bones has been lost with time. But if she was a married woman, her honorific, as her honorific suggests, there may be a clue as to that somewhere. A woman who bordered on being eccentric was the boy's own grandmother, Granny Bassett, and her story he could tell with first-hand knowledge. Yep, we got more than enough time for one more. It is five pages. We can do this. Chapter 16. The Legend of Granny Bassett The wide-brimmed sun hat on Granny's head was tied down by a silk scarf that went under her chin, knotted tightly to prevent the breeze from lifting it from her head as she pedalled the state highway. Her well-muscled legs pumped rhythmically as her bicycle chewed up the miles between towns at a steady pace, belying the fact that the peddler was approaching seventy and had always been out... Nope, and had been out for hours exploring the highways and byways. She was super fit, super clever, and super unworried by what other people might make of her. That was Granny Bassett. Passengers on buses travelling between Masterton and Greytown would look out the windows. There's Mrs Bassett on her bike again, giving her a wave. Granny would really look up to acknowledge them. She would be wrapped up in her thoughts going over what she had achieved that day. 
Maybe she had found a strange rock, a piece of petrified wood, a little native plant to take a cutting from. These items were raw grist to Granny's mill. Her brilliant mind and zest for life made Granny stand out in town. She owned a tobacconist, barber shop, and billiards parlour in Main Street, all under one roof. Her youngest son, Noel, was the barber, doubling as the cigarette seller when Granny got the urge to leave the shop and cycle away on one of her expeditions. Old family friend Harry Jones, who had lived with her, and Tom on the Carterton farm, had stayed on as Granny's boarder when she shifted to Greytown after Tom died and ran the billiards and smoker room. Did I say smoker or snooker? Ran the billiards and snooker room, just in case. Snooker rooms were regarded as dens of iniquity, rooms blanketed in tobacco smoke, the homes of misspent youth. That didn't stop the town's young hustlers from gathering there in the early evenings to pit their skills against each other. Harry was a graduate of the School of Hard Knocks, a returned World War I soldier who knew how to handle hard-bitten men, let alone teenage boys, so he had little trouble keeping them in check. He had been raised in a South Island orphanage and had spent his young life constantly underfed and hungry. As soon as he was old enough to look after himself, Harry had set out to see what the world had to offer. He humped his bluey through the outback of Australia and somewhere along the lines learned how to become an expert horseman. Back in New Zealand with no prospects, he signed up to go to war thinking, like thousands of others, that it would be a short-lived adventure. Instead, it turned out to be a long, cruel bloodbath, and Harry didn't escape unscathed. He was wounded and repatriated, not to Britain, but to a French military hospital, where he was tasked with the job of keeping badly injured soldiers calm as they underwent crude emergency surgery and with cleaning up afterwards. Compare that with keeping order in the billiard saloon was a cakewalk. Granny's inquiring mind roamed across the whole life, the whole of life? The whole, whole life? No. Granny's inquiring mind roamed across the whole of life, probing for knowledge and storing it in her hugely retentive memory. History, geology, and poetry were her favourites, and she became a walking encyclopaedia on all three. Originally from Marlborough, she met and married carpenter Tom Bassett and had shifted north. Tom had helped build the Regent Theatre in Masterton, Harry Jones being a labourer on site. And before they took on the Carterton farm, whoops, no, why did I say that with weird emphasis? Being a labourer on the site before they took on the Carterton farm. History had always been Granny's love, and when widowed, she had time to really set her mind to it. Being of Scottish ancestry, she could rattle off the names of old Scottish kings and their battles and all the clans, all their tartans, without blinking an eyelid. The entire works of William Shakespeare were neatly stored away in her head, and on the tip of her tongue ready for recital at any time. Geology too was a passion. What she didn't know about rocks, how mountains were formed, and, and the like, simply wasn't worth knowing. Granny learned a leading geology. Ah, oh, we were doing so well. Granny learned a leading geology professor was about to take a party of students on a tramp into the Tararua Ranges to study rocks, mountain terrain and all soil types. Despite getting on in years, she decided to sign up to it. It was a weekend course designed for university students and other supposedly young and fit types, but this did not deter Granny, ignoring the advice of those in charge of the expedition, who had gently tried to persuade her to try something less physically demanding. Granny insisted on joining up. The sniggers of the twenty-year-old students, who were her travelling companions, soon died away, to be replaced by an overwhelming sense of awe. Granny Bassett scampered along the bush tracks and up the rocky outcrops with confidence of a mountain goat. At times she was asked to slow down by the geology experts in charge, and it soon became apparent she knew as much as any of them, at times even more. By the end of the tramp, young students were picking her brain. The old geologists were treating her as one of them, and she returned home without even a pulled muscle to blot her two days of sheer bliss. Granny spent time hunting for grey wacky rocks of a certain size and shape, 
eventually gathering up dozens of them, which she put in formation along both sides of the pathway leading to her wooden villa. Then she painted the rock tops with thick, dark red oil paint. No concrete curbing for Granny. Her home was directly behind her shop, with her property running from Main Street right through to West Street. On the south side was the South Whited Upper Working Men's Club, the two properties being separated by a corrugated iron fence. To the north, and closer to the main road, was the home of the Patel family. Despite owning a tobacconist, Granny never smoked, and was a strict teetotaler, although an entry in her diary dated May 30, 1944, suggests Granny may have broken her rules on one occasion. We have an invitation to Nairi Williams' wedding, and we have just bought her a pair of range wear casseroles. June 3rd, 1944. Went to the wedding, very nice, beautiful girls, nice wine. Everyone kissed the bride and everyone kissed everybody else. That one slip up aside, Granny abhorred alcohol, telling the boy he was growing up all of the evils Oops, telling the boy as he was growing up, all of the evils drink had delivered to families throughout the land. Living close by the club was a source of irritation to her, and she let her imagination run wild. According to Granny, drinkers spilled out of the club at closing time, yelling, shouting, swearing and urinating against her fence before jumping into cars and roaring around the car park before heading off. Little or none of it ever happened. But it strengthened Granny's belief in the evils of drink and rubbed off on her daughter Sheila, who remained a teetotaler for her entire life too. The boy, it can safely be said, did not follow suit. Granny loved films and would cross the road at least once a week to go to the pictures, which screened in Greytown Town Hall. She would rarely go on a Friday night. That was late night shopping and she would be behind the shop counter. But she hardly ever missed a Saturday night. If nothing else she was tempting if nothing else was tempting her, she would sometimes go to the Saturday matinee as well. Preparing for the movies was not just a matter of popping on a good skirt and putting her lippy on. No. Granny boiled the jug, made a thermos of tea, which she popped into a carry bag, and took her Mac Mac and took her McLaughlin tartan blanket from the sofa to tuck around her legs. If she felt a bit peckish, she would pop out at the interval, leaving blanket and thermos on the theatre seat, and scurry home to butter a couple of crusts of bread to take back. She soaked up anything the films had to offer. And she had her favourites. Granny loved a good western. Not a B-grade, mind. It had to be good. She adored the Magnificent Seven, biking to Carterton to see it, and going to all the screenings in Greytown. In a rare moment of candour, she admitted to having fallen for the hero of the piece, handsome, dark-eyed Yule Brenner, and made no secret that she had been able to step back as a young girl, she would have been on his trail. Granny knew that was wishful thinking, and her chances of sneering the Hollywood legend would have been remote. But, as the saying goes, when you grow too old to dream. Her life was a clutter of activity, her interests diverse and many. But that didn't include being a slave to housework. Granny's home was always clean and tidy to a degree. But for Granny, the world was far more the world had far more to offer than washing and ironing. Cooking was another matter entirely. She was a good cook and an outstanding pie maker, her speciality being sausage pie. Granny would summon her grandchildren to her home every so often for a tea, which invariably included a huge dish of sausage pie the favourite of all. Being a regular churchgoer, worshipping at the Presbyterian Church on West Street, Granny insisted on saying of grace before each meal. Usually she chose to say grace herself, but on occasion she would ask one of the children to do so. That was when it got sticky. The boy and his cousins had the foresight to each prepare a short grace, which was kept in abeyance should it be needed. Not so the boy's younger brother Evan. And the inevitable happened. One balmy summer's night, seated around the kitchen table, young Evan was called on to say grace. An embarrassed silence was broken with a handful of words which compounded his discomfort and sealed his fate. Two, four, six, eight, boggin, don't wait. 
The kid screamed with laughter, but Granny was not amused, and gave him a dressing down. He never was likely to forget. Thankfully, the rest of the evening passed without further incident. Granny loved live performances, and was a leading light in the early days of the Greytown Little Theatre, always being offered, and taking on, a major role. On stage, she was brilliant. Her sense of gay abandon, her panache, and ability to pull off a comic line won her a mountain of accolades, and she bathed in the limelight. Granny loved trees and gardening, believing a town like Greytown had to treasure its trees and plant shrubs and flowers not just to look good, but to help the environment. She was one of the founding members of the Greytown Beautifying Society and could be seen beavering away as a volunteer gardener in spots throughout the town. She wore her wide-brimmed hat tied under her chin and a floral skirt of many colours and white tennis shoes. One sunny afternoon, while on her hands and knees weeding in the flower garden in the centre of town, Granny clashed with a woman who, for reasons unknown, had long grated on her nerves. Mary Higgison, known by her second name Alice, was around Granny's age. She and husband Bill had raised a sizable family and lived in a quaint cottage on the same side of Main Street as Granny's shop, but further south. Alice, like Granny, never minced her words. She had a reputation as a woman who, when crossed, pulled no punches and took no prisoners, a carbon copy of Granny, in fact. This particular afternoon, Alice was making her way to Greytown School, using the narrow walkway that ran from Main Street to East Street. Bill was the school's caretaker, and when school was over for the day, Alice joined him to clean classrooms. The walkway was bordered on the south side by towering corfi trees, whose sturdy bows had been allowed to droop to such an extent that walkers had to keep their wits about them or risk a head-on collision. Spying Granny, Alice pounced on the opportunity to take her to task. Those trees should be cut down. They are dangerous. I banged my head on them twice yesterday. Granny's reply was vintage Granny Bassett. I would have thought once would have been enough. Alice went on without another word, and Granny went back to weeding. Granny was decades ahead of her time in matters of science. She spoke of looming problems with air and sea pollution long before bureaucrats had even seriously thought of them. Likewise, she had a great respect for racial diversity, believing in tolerance and acceptance between races. She studied the history and the way of life of early Māori, and she liked to practice her knowledge on those who were willing to take her on. Behind the counter of the tobacconist shop, Granny would delight in swapping notes with Māori elders from nearby Papawai. Her knowledge of their culture and respect for them, and as a people, led to many making sure that they called into the shop whenever they came to town. She would rip them mercilessly, all in good fun, and get away with it. Once when the boy was in the shop, helping out by stacking the shelves with packets of cigarettes, a favourite elder of Granny's, known for his grasp in history, came in. The talk soon turned to history and the banter began. With a cheeky glint in her eye, Granny made the astonishing remark, You know, Johnny, I reckon if we Pākehā suddenly packed up and left New Zealand, you fellows would be eating each other within six months. Young and all he was, the boy was shocked. Surely Granny couldn't get away with that. But far from taking offence, Johnny, a little bloke who always sported a couple of days stubble and smoked cigarettes in a holder broke into a wide grin. Six months, Mrs Bassett. We wouldn't wait that long. More like three months. Eventually age caught up with Granny. She sold the shop to her son Noel and moved into a council-owned flat, spending her remaining time on earth flitting between the flat and the home of her daughter Sheila and husband Ron. Her death ended not only a life well lived, but took away one of the town's best loved characters. Right, that's three chapters. We've got, how many have we got left? Uh, maybe three episodes more. So like I said, I'm not coming in on, on New Year's Day. I'll probably be sleeping in. I will come back on the 8th, which is also a Monday. So that's probably, yeah, a couple of weeks. So have a brilliant holiday and New Year's break. Look after each other, and we will see you in the new year. Have a good one.